evening. Um, don't know about you, but this was a lot less scary in front of the bathroom mirror this morning. Um, so to those of you who don't know me, um, my name's George. Um, I've been in and working sort of behind the scenes in the ABT now for just shy of three years. Um, yeah, so I'm not the greatest at like speaking. Sometimes I do actually forget what I'm saying, and I run over my own words a few times, so bear with me. Um, I'm also not the great at reading out loud, as uh, some of you guys have known at the, uh, what's you call it, the, um, let's do it now, 80s or 30s, that's it. <laughs> um, so uh, my message I brought uh, tonight is directed to anyone here who isn't a Christian. Um, you may be wondering what it's all about, or you've just been invited by a friend. Um, but it's just, my message is no less relevant to those who are Christians. Um, so please don't let the blazer and the shirt um, let you think that I'm all high and mighty. Um, I actually just, I just, just wear it because it, I think it's, it's good to wear. Um, you know, it's not for God. He doesn't mind if you wear a blazer, a t-shirt, a hoodie, whatever. Um, I actually wear this for you guys because you're important. You're good people and you're important and I want to wear my best for you. Um, so that sort of brings us on to tonight's topic is perception, you know, how we view things. Um, so what is it? Well, looking at the definition on Google, um, it's the way in which something is regarded, understood, or interpreted. Perception is important and used by all of us to interact and think about people and the greater world around us. I'm going to go into two points. Two points I believe are important to help, to help aid anyone's journey in learning about the importance of being a Christian, about Christianity in general, and the core of what it's about. So my first point is the perception of ourselves. You know, how do we actually see ourselves? Do we see ourselves as innocent, fruitless, without blame? Do we see ourselves as wonderful, you know, beautiful, handsome? Do we see ourselves as charismatic, cool, or popular, perhaps? Or perhaps on the other end of the spectrum completely? You know, perhaps see ourselves as worthless, pointless, you know, nothing good comes of us. Maybe we're angry, uncontrolled, or just unnoticed. Maybe we're lost, damned, or feel condemned. You know, why am I actually bringing this up? Because that's a really tough thing to talk about, ultimately. You know, we all have good and bad aspects that affect our outlook on ourselves and how we view the world around us. Some of you may never have considered there is a right and a wrong way to view ourselves. But truly, there is. You know, there's a good book that describes and tells us all the answers that we actually need for life. And that's the Bible. So what does the Bible actually say about us? So let's actually start with the bad. I always like the bad news, because it's just getting out of the way. You know, so in Jeremiah 17, 9, it says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? In Romans 3, 10, it says there is no, right, no one righteous. No, not one. And then in Mark 7, 21 to 23, it says, For from within, out of the heart of man, comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within, and they defile a person. Those are some really, really hard points to hear. But look around you, and you'll see the truth a bit. We steal, lie, and gamble our way through life to try to get anything that we deem as, you know, some sort of... I've lost myself now. There we go. Uh, so <laughs> I'll start again. We steal, lie, and gamble away through life to try to get anything that we deem as good, and then to top it all off, we justify it, if not to others, at least to ourselves. Let's face it. Humanity is pretty bad. George, this is just a telling off I hear you say. You said you're not a high and mighty type, and this is the complete opposite. Who are you to judge me? If any of you, sorry, not quite, but bear with me. If any of you have had the experience of being admitted to hospital for an infection or disease, that you know that the doctor has to diagnose the illness before he can come to a cure. And here's the catch for us. Our hearts are tainted. We are all born with a disease so severe that it can't just kill us once, it kills us forever. It's terminal, malignant, and evil. It's sin. The Bible even uses quite a paradoxical statement in describing how bad sin is. Sin is exceedingly sinful. 
That's how bad it is, my friends. For those of you who are not Christians, I have grave, urgent news. You need to hear. You are on the fast track to a place so bad, so terrible, Ross, me stop again now, bear with me. So bad, so terrible, that even its description in the Bible cannot do it enough justice for its sheer horror. Hell is where we are all deserving for willingly going against God's law. That's how bad sin is. George, I'm still hearing bad news. All you've said is that so far I'm disease-ridden, I'm going to die, and I deserve to go to hell. Yes, you need to know that. Every single human on this spinning ball is on his way to a place so severe, so terrible, that we really don't want to go there. You need to perceive yourself as what you are. So we've heard enough about the bad news. So what's the good news then? Let's move on to something a bit, bit lighter. That's the perception of God. I'm sure anyone who's been here hasn't given this, or who hasn't given this thing a thought before is looking at me thinking, that man's a lunatic, a well-dressed lunatic. Let me bring you on the second point of tonight. So when we think of God, what do we actually think? You know, is he some formless creature that passively watches the world go on, on his existence? Is he, you know, some man in the cloud just smiting people he deems unworthy? You know, or is he an angry being in his high heaven, unjustly judging you for your deeds? And let me tell you, friends, none of those are true. Let me tell you who God is. In Isaiah 40:28, it says, Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. In Micah 7, 18 and 19, it says, God is a God like you, pardoning iniquity. Sorry, my apologies. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will, atta- sorry, he will again have compassion on us and he will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cost all our sins into, sorry, he will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. I need to bring it closer, really. I'm on the phone as well, by the way, just not on a big iPad. So, And then Psalm 1830 says, This God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. And he's a shield for those who take refuge in him. So just in these three extracts, just these small extracts from a very big book. God is infinite, all-powerful, almighty, and the creator of all. He's all-loving. He loves us. He's compassionate. He genuinely, emotionally is compassionate for you, all of you. He is just and a forgiver and a pardoner. He does not want you to be cursed with sin and he offers you into his family. How we perceive God is critically important because it's very easy to form our own idea of who God is and just go with that. Just believe it. Just run with it because it's easier to get our own ideas. But on the purposes of the Bi- sorry, but one of the purposes of the Bible is that God tells us who his character is. And please believe me when I tell you the Bible isn't a tragedy or a soap opera. It's a redemption story. It's God's love story to humanity. God knows how severe sin is to humanity. This is summarized in John 3:16 to 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. So what does this all mean? Well, put simply, and partly because of time, God loves you so much that he sent his son to take the punishment for our sin. God, infinite, almighty, all-loving God, sent a very important part of himself to be limited to the form of a man, 
Jesus, Jesus Christ. He saw the world as we perceived it, and despite having a human body that had the capability of doing so, he never sinned, not once. Jesus lived a sinless life and laid it down in a horrific manner, beaten, tortured, and hung on a cross. All to take the punishment for the sin we justly deserve. But after three days, he rose to life again, thus beating death, so that anyone who believes on him and follows his example will be granted the promise and assurance of eternal life. So how is this applicable? Well, it's a really simple principle. And I've tried to paraphrase it a little bit just to bring it down a bit there. Um, but to believe on Jesus Christ, that's all it is. But what is believing on? This can be summarized in three points. To confess openly that Jesus, the Son of God's, sorry, the Son of God's life, death, and resurrection was to save humanity from sin and eternal death. To pray to, God reg- to pray to God regularly, whether that be for seeking forgiveness, ask for guidance, or just giving thanks, or anything and everything in between. God wants you to speak with him. And to do everything in the power to follow Jesus' example for life, and when we cannot, to trust in his promises that God will give us the strength to carry on. These three things sound big, and they are. Trust me, they are. I screw it up all the time. But part of being a church is that we truly help each other to achieve this. No man or woman is an island, and we are here to help encourage, build, and support one another. Please, sorry. As Christians, we want all, all, sorry, we want all humanity to know that it, it, that it is to accept God's gift of Jesus' salvation, and we extend that invitation to any and all of you here please consider the severity of where you put your faith in life. I beg you to take the time to think it through. As Christians, we do not have a blind faith. It is true, sorry, it is a true, honest relationship with God. That relationship starts when you ask God to forgive you for your sins and pledge your life to him. God loves you. He loves you that much that he died for you. He wants you to join him. Bear in mind, God's not forceful. He lets every person decide for themselves whether they like his gift of eternal life or not. He's not forceful. It's your choice. If you feel that your past actions mean that there's no way that God could want you, forgive you or love you, then please look at the Bible. God has already given plenty of examples of this simply not being true. One One of the best examples is a parable told by Jesus himself, the parable of the prodigal son. The story goes, there is a son and a father, and the father has all the good things he needs for his family. The son, believing that he can do better, takes his father's inheritance and goes to a faraway place and spends it how he deems fit, exactly how he perceives it. By the end, by the end of this, he's in a position that he's lost it all, and that contemplating eating, and he's contemplating eating the pig food. He realized that his father's servants have it better than him and that he decides to go and ask for his father's forgiveness and become one of his servants because he perceived that as his only option. However, when he gets home, his father sees him and is overcome with happiness and joy and he runs to his son, embraces him. He clothes him and gives him his ring and feeds him the best food. The analogy here is that we are the son and that God is the father. God has no interest in belittling or cursing those who call upon his name. In fact, he gives us the best things he has. Friends, ask his forgiveness and come to his throne. God loves you so much, he wants you in his house. There's not, there's not a single person here who cannot call upon his name and come to him. This is a tough message to give to you. I'm telling you that you're in the wrong. That's not easy to stand here and do, and it's certainly not easy to hear. But it's the truth, and it'd be evil of me not to tell you that you're in danger and not show you how to get out of that danger. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That isn't just poetic, that's, much, that's very much plainly spoken. You, can't, you cannot do anything to get yourself out of the chains and the burden that is sin. I do not want you perceiving anything other than the fact that Jesus has already paid for your debt, paid for your sin, and taken the punishment for it, and out of this sheer love for us, opened his hand for you to take and live with him forever. 
You may have questions. Please ask any of us here. Martin, Joel, and Andrew, all just to name a few. We're all here to help and offer guidance and advice as best we can. I want to leave you with this, six vital certainties. Number one, life is short and uncertain. Number two, death is sure. Number three, judgment is inevitable. Number four, sin is exceedingly sinful. Number five, hell is a dreadful reality. And number six, Christ alone can save you. Those who aren't Christians here, please, please really think on this. You're one prayer away from salvation. Thank you.